Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 20th Annual Diversity Summit. My name is Rashmi Goel, and this week we're going to be discussing different identity groups. Uh, so our talk today is on uh, navigating multiple pandemics, the Asian community conversation. My name is Rashmi Goel, and I am a professor at the law school and I'm pleased to be your moderator for today's discussion. I'm gonna to give you a little bit of a background on what the question was that we're supposed to discuss today and then uh, tell you a little bit about our presenters. And I hope that we are going to have a wonderful, fruitful and lively discussion on the issue. The suggestion or the prompt we were given was this. Over the last year, the United States has been confronted with the reality of multiple pandemics that is COVID-19, continued racial injustice, et cetera. For communities of color, the existence of COVID-19 may be new in form, but not in practice. Racial injustice in its many forms, education, housing, employment, health, and wellness, policing, et cetera, have been part of the US since its colonialist founding. Noting this, how might we consider the impacts of these pandemics on Asian communities? What are the implications for racial justice and our collective push towards equity? Our conversations will be conducted through the lens of DU, Denver, Colorado, and the United States. And with that, I'd like to um, welcome our speakers and again, welcome to our audience over Zoom. One of the advantages of the pandemic is you can be attending this from wherever you are. And uh, we're so pleased to have all of you. We're fortunate today to have three wonderful scholars, thinkers, activists to discuss the issues facing the Asian community now during the pandemic and as we move forward. Our first speaker today is Mei Lin. She is an expert in critical race, intersectionality and social, youth, social movements. As a postdoctoral fellow for the Social Movement Support Lab, a project of IRISE, she continues her work supporting racial justice movements led by those most impacted by injustice. This includes different types of research, teaching, acting as an active accomplice, and organizing directly. For example, she supported youth organizing for racial educational justice and is engaged in graduate student unionizing and housing justice movements. So uh, we're very pleased to begin first with Mei Lin. Wonderful, thank you. So I have some slides that I will share and let's hope this goes off without a hitch. The joys of Zoom. You just get a confirmation, these are showing up all right? Wonderful, thank you. All right, well, thank you for that uh, introduction. And so today I'm gonna to start off um, just by talking about the need for Asian American thick, uh, thick solidarity, disrupting racial capitalism for just recovery. So today in the, in the couple of minutes that I have, I want to argue that the plight of Asian Americans in the present and wake of COVID-19 hinges on our active commitment to multiracial and intersectional solidarity. This is especially relevant as we are grieving and also debating how to respond to the rise of anti-Asian violence, of which there's been um, a spate of, of several um, really unfortunate and tragic incidents in the, past, uh, in the past week. While some have called for more policing in response, those um, collectives like Asians for Black Lives, uh, a post of which is depicted here, have argued against solutions that tar target and further criminalize Black folks. Instead, they point out, we need more expansive solutions for defining safety. We need to fight against the root causes of crime, such as disinvestment, anemic social supports, the need um, and the need for which, uh, the need for social supports has become especially evident over the last year. Asian Americans must embrace the concept of thick solidarity what Savannah Sean Gay and Roseanne Liu argue is, quote, a kind of solidarity that mobilizes empathy in ways that do not gloss over difference, but rather pushes into the specificity and irreducibility of racialized experiences. This means we must confront head on 
difference within the very broad sort of socio-political construction that we call Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And also means grappling with our difference in relationship to how we're racialized and constructed to other BIPOC, that is Black, Indigenous, and communities of color. And of course, this must also acknowledge that there are Black Asian folks. Doing so really helps us realize a bold vision for a just society that we know is so direly needed at this moment, before, and in the future. So again, thinking about the future means that we must situate Asian American experiences within a broader context of entangled and deeply rooted inequities. Dr. Whitney Pirtle argues that racial capitalism is a fundamental cause of the devastating racial disparities in those who have been impacted by COVID-19, as depicted here by the COVID tracking project. So in Los Angeles, where I am uh, working remotely and have been living, um, Pacific Islanders have the highest infection rate of any racial or ethnic group. We know Latinx communities have very much been disproportionately harmed as well. As conceptualized by Cedric Robinson and others, racial capitalism shows how racist and capitalist exploitation are intertwined and mutually constitutive. And so again, this goes back way before COVID-19. Studies have found that Americans living in areas with higher levels of smog, oftentimes poor black and brown communities have been more likely to die from COVID-19. We need to think about, again, health disparities as not being about individual behavior, but rather about racial capitalism as fundamental cause as being behind racialized residential segregation that is unconscionably and for too long exposed these communities to toxins and to waste that gets under the skin and truly hurts us. So practicing thick solidarity means recognizing different positioning within systems and conditions of racial capitalism. That means recognizing difference, again, within our communities among Asian Americans and in relationship to other BIPOC, again, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, in the slide before, we saw that there was a big category of Asian. And when, um, you know, one thing that that obscures is the difference within these communities. So for example, um, again, in LA and elsewhere, Filipinox, Filipinx folks have really been disproportionately impacted. Um, almost a fifth of registered nurses in California are Filipinx. And that really goes back to the US colonial relationship with the Philippines. We can recognize and hold that difference, but we can also recognize the ways that systemic anti-Blackness has played out in COVID. Um, so here I linked, uh, and all my links are in the supplementary materials, but here I linked um, a ProPublica article, um, which cites Dr. James's work about the concept of the John Hendry syndrome. I mean, it points to how um, not only racialized poverty itself and experiences of racialized poverty, but the pressure that is needed to, the pressure that is imposed to break out of racialized poverty really gets embodied and um, makes Black folks uh, sick. As Johnson and Martin, the authors of this um, piece put it, quote, weathering isn't specific to race, but it is believed to take a particular toll on Black people because of the unique, unrelenting stress caused by racism that wears away the body and the spirit. So in terms of moving towards and developing thick solidarity, that means that we also have to confront some uncomfortable, uncomfortable realities the way that Asian Americans, and coming from where I'm from, I see a lot of East Asians, my fellow East Asian Americans doing this as well. The ways that we have benefited from what Claire Jean Kim calls our relative valorization within white supremacy. That are ways, the way we may actively be invested in and really uphold in, in overt active ways, anti-Blackness and racial capitalism. Um, and so a few years ago in Koreatown, Los Angeles, uh, where I used to live before I moved to another part of LA, um, you know, some Korean immigrant organizations protested a homeless shelter being built in the community. But there was also other Korean Amer American organizations that really stepped up, like Koreatown Immigrant Workers Alliance, K-Town for All, Korean Resource Center. They actively supported not only the building of the homeless shelter, but also engaged in organizing and advocacy and mutual aid to really address the root causes of homelessness. And so I wanted to point out this example because I think it's relevant for what we're experiencing now and the road for how we move um, forward ahead. Um, for me, the latter is really a model of how to actively um, act in ways uh, in solidarity, in, this, in thick solidarity, to disrupt racial capitalism and to widen our circles of care for ourselves and for each other. 
But it also means we have to confront the uncomfortable reality um, of, of the former and think about how we confront and grapple with that head on. So in summary, I want to just point out, you know, the ra racial capitalism that led to these disparities in COVID-19 really warrants our collective power in carving out a much more expansive and much more just future. Um, this means we have to get at the root of the systems that are hurting us, that are making us sick, and that have been dehumanizing our communities and related, but also in different ways. Thick solidarity, again, is a way for us to expand our circles of care with attentiveness to difference within and between our communities. Coming together to dismantle the violent systems that causes pain and suffering means that we can hold and grapple with the trage tragedies and sadness um, and the terrors of anti-Asian violence, but also do so in ways that really call for solutions that address the needs of black and brown communities and then not further criminalize. And to conclude, I call upon our fellow Asian Americans to embrace a thick solidarity towards complex coalitions that are much needed for us to imagine and enact societies of abundance and care. And leaving this here, I wanted to share again, um, just a post from the Black Bay Area, which um, they had started a GoFundMe for Asian elders who were harmed by violence. And I think just some really great and concrete examples of what thick solidarity looks like for um, us to care for each other. Thank you. I think you're on mute. I think you're on mute, Rashmi. One would think after all this time, I'd remember to unmute myself with so many Zoom meetings that we've all been in. Um, but I saw it happen yesterday on on um, uh, on a new show on Meet the Press. So I feel a little bit vindicated because it happens. Uh, it happens to those who are even m more experienced than we are. Uh, thank you so much, May, for those comments. It already raises a lot of questions in my mind, in particular about the Pan-Asian identity that we are struggling with anyways. I think that we struggle as uh, different members of this sort of Pan-Asian community to express and um, find our own, uh, our, our own identities be recognized and our own histories be recognized so that our own voices can contribute in a way that's authentic to the to the discussion and I think also the alliances that you point out between not only Asian people among ourselves but Asian people with other communities of color particularly black folk and what it means to uh, build solidarity uh, particularly against white supremacy I think very very important today especially uh, even as we even as we move into the second impeachment trial of of the uh, president um, of the former, pres former president, President Trump, and ask how much white supremacy had to do with uh, his actions and with the storming of the Capitol. I think it really calls on us to be active in addressing white supremacy, um, not just in, in our daily lives, but you know politically what that means. So those are some questions that I think we're gonna be talking about as we proceed. Uh, and our next speaker is Deepa Sundaram. Uh, really happy to have her here. Her areas of expertise include Hindu ritual and performance, South Asian digital culture, and critical theory. Uh, Dr. Deepa Sundaram is a scholar of performance, ritual, and digital culture in South Asia at the University of Denver, um, which, um, I, which uh, sits, as we know, on the tribal lands of the Cheyenne and Arapaho people. And we want to recognize our role as an educational institution in um, oppressing the indigenous peoples who came before us here. Uh, her research, though, examines the formation of Hindu virtual religious publics through online platforms, social media, apps, and emerging technologies, such as virtual reality and artificial intelligence. Her current monograph project is titled Go Globalizing Dharma and examines how commercial ritual websites fashion a new digital canon for Hindu religious practice, uh, effectively branding religious identities through a neoliberal Vedicizing of uh, virtual spaces. So I'm really excited to hear her remarks as well. Thank you, Deepa. Um, please, uh, please begin. <laughs> 
Um, thanks, everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, I don't have the lovely presentation <laughs> that Maylin had, and it's. Um, I'm really glad, though, she brought up the issues that she did because um, so many of those have much to do with what I would like to say today. So um, in the interest of beginning this talk in the way that I think is very important, um, I really appreciate Rashmi, including our land acknowledgement. Um, we do sit on the traditional lands of the Cheyenne and Arapaho people as members of the DU and Denver community. And we have the privilege to work on those unceded lands. Um, and I think it's really important that we recognize that. But I also wish to start out talking about my positionality before I speak. Um, in considering my positionality, I always ref uh, return to scholar Dia de Costa's reflection on her progressive upbringing, um, where she writes that people raised in relatively liberal homes like mine are socialized to evade their caste identity. I Bengali Brahmin socialization is no exception to this rule of liberal casteism. Our relentlessly projected castelessness is a central modality through which we engage in the everyday terror of caste supremacy. And I bring this up because racial justice and thinking about pan-Asian solidarity can't be discussed, in my view, without thinking about race and caste. Um, a lot of people think that caste is something that just happens in some other place in South Asia. Um, but one of our most prominent and wealthy minorities in this country are South Asians, and they did bring their caste politics with them, despite, as I was raised, to embrace a so-called progressive value of castelessness and a sort of non-Black identity that was still supposed to speak to equity, acceptance, and empathy to difference. You know, my parents associated those values with the American dream. My upbringing was an exercise in erasure and an acceptance of inequality and inequity as fact, rather than a carefully constructed system designed for my success. Professionally, I have been tacitly, I've tacitly been encouraged to continue that erasure rather than challenge it. As a brown woman in largely white professional and personal spaces, I know the feeling of being an outsider. However, my family's romantical upper class lineage provided a sort of inoculation against the caste divisions inherent in my ability to succeed. I could decry racial discrimination in the American context while never fully interrogating why I had the right to speak to this in the first place. My privilege is to ignore these inequities that made my entry into the American Academy possible and to avoid considering how my success in that space was always characterized by those around me as an inevitability. Terms like hard work and dedication were not meant to inspire myself or others, but to justify my elite status. These, they were masks, hiding how these spaces were always already out of reach for those without my advantages of birth, class, and caste privilege. I was destined to succeed because I was already inside. And I share this to begin my talk today about Asian solidarity because it's important to remember that intersectional privilege is part and parcel of that solidarity. It is something that is part and parcel of when we think about the disproportionate effects of the, pand of the COVID pandemic, as well as thinking about how it intersects with the racial justice explosion we saw this summer that Asian communities have largely been inoculated and they have done this through generational communities. They have done this by bringing with them a certain type of elitism that has always said, this is not our fight. And this is particularly true. I can't speak for every community, of course, but this is particularly true in South Asian communities. Largely the South Asian immigrants we see in this country are people who stem from wealthy communities in India. That is not true with every South Asian. Certainly, um, we, we, if you live in a more diverse area, which I grew up in Indiana, so it's certainly true there. But um, if, you, if you go to like say New York City, when I lived there, you certainly see a, a broader swath of South Asians. But it's important to remember that most immigrants in this country are wealthy. That's why they've been able to get here. So when we talk about things like solidarity, particularly in the face of a crisis, there is a lot more to get past than thinking about whether one identifies with particular liberal or progressive values or maybe identifies with more conservative values. 
there are intersectional ways in which those values manifest in these communities, partly linked to things like prejudice, partly linked to things like inherited class privilege, partly linked to things like um, one's belief in whether or not one should be political. One of the things I was raised with and as a sort of editorial here is that my family always believed that you shouldn't interfere in white people's politics. Let them do what they're going to do. We just have to work hard and keep our heads down. This was something that they had maintained throughout the 90s, right? Um, for the first time during um, 2008, my, pa my, my parents registered to vote and voted. And it was the very first time they ever felt like they, their voice mattered. And I point this out because it's also the first time that they could acknowledge that they could see themselves in solidarity with a community of color that wasn't their own. They saw Barack Obama as somebody that actually mattered to them. And I'm not suggesting that, of course, he's also elite in many ways, but it was a big moment for my community with a person who wasn't South Asian or wasn't Asian or wasn't an immigrant. They didn't ever have that before. And so this is sort of the background for what I, I my remarks today. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about race, Asian identity and pan-Asian solidarity and the intersectional nature of privilege in terms of how we can dismantle white supremacy, but not just white supremacy, what I call cultural supremacy. This isn't, white supremacy is a category. It is not about white people per se. It is something that is instrumentalized globally in different communities. If we go to India, it is instrumentalized in Savarna or what we call upper castes, right? Um, so before I begin uh, talking and just giving a few remarks, I just wanna mention a few organizations and a couple of examples of how caste and race work together here and really help <laughs> uphold white supremacy frameworks. Um, there's a wonderful organization called equalitylabs.org led by a South Asian woman, Thane Mori Sandarajan. And she's the first person to work with the United States Congress. Actually, her organization was able to present to the United States Congress and have a, have a hearing on caste in the United States. She was able to interview a number of South Asian Americans who are not from elite caste groups to find out how they have been racialized and discriminated against systematically here. Um, she presented this report to try to get our Congress to recognize caste as a protected category. She also was instrumental in leading a lawsuit against Cisco um, Enterprises in California to have the first ever caste discrimination lawsuit brought and California is the first place that has started to, to recognize caste as a discriminatory category. Um, and then finally, Emory University is the only university I know of right now that includes caste as a protected category. I point this out is that mainly to use, let's use Kimberly Crenshaw, um, I'm sure Rashmi is very familiar, right? But as, as Kimberly Crenshaw um, talks about in mapping the margins, intersectionality, identity politics, and violence against women of color, she says, the problem with identity politics is not that it fails to transcend difference as some critics charge, but rather the opposite. It frequently conflates or ignores intergroup differences. And I think that that's really important when we think through how pan-Asian solidarity would work because it is a very important for us to recognize the levels of privilege within those communities um, as we go forward. So a couple of other points, um, you know, right after the 2016 election, anti-South Asian racism was on the rise. And that's largely because uh, you had a large group of people who felt really empowered. I'm reminded of Aziz Ansari's Saturday Night Live cold open, where he said, I, I to paraphrase, I didn't realize so many of you were hiding your racism and we're sorry we didn't thank you for that. Um, but we did see many, many South Asians get attacked and largely because people thought they were of another community, not because they were South Asian. And I think that that's really important to put out there. The same thing happened after 9-11 where many Sikhs were attacked because they were wearing turbans and mistaken as Muslims. This type of mistaken racism, I think also speaks to the privilege of these communities. It's really important. Many South Asians were outraged, yes, because of the attacks, but also for being mistaken for Muslims, right? 
And that, I think, speaks to why these kinds of solidarities are so challenging in these communities. Anti-racism in South Asian communities is still a newer push. Um, they, you, you still face significant anti-black, anti excuse me, colorist, racist paradigms that must be dismantled, particularly in what we call non-resident Indian or NRI communities and what, how they see themselves in relation to South Asians abroad. Most South Asians in this country, something like 79%, identify as either democratic or progressive in their politics. In fact, under um, during the Obama administration, 89% of South Asians had registered as Democrats and saw themselves as voting for a Democrat. Um, what's interesting about this is they're also the wealthiest minority in this country that voted for the Democrats in such large numbers. However, there is a cognitive dissonance between how they see themselves aligned with these progressive values in the US and how they see what's happening, for example, in South Asia or in India. So these same Indians who will say that anti-Black racism is wrong will tell you that India and caste politics or the push of Muslims there to get recognized and be treated equally is a completely different thing. They will tell you that for example, what has happened in Kashmir, where the internet has been shut down for years, is diff Muslims are different than us here. And again, I point to this because when we think about the COVID-19 pandemic, even within the South Asian community, there is a broad difference between those who came from upper caste wealthy backgrounds who were the ones who were able to work at home, like myself. I have the privilege to work at home and keep my job. And that's partly thanks to DU, of course. But South Asian cab drivers in New York, they didn't have that privilege. And if anyone's interested, I will post a link. Um, I'll send a link to the Office of Diversity and Inclusion on, um, written by a woman named Sujata Gidla, um, who is an MTA conductor in New York City. She also wrote a book called Ants Among Elephants. She is a Dalit woman, a woman from an oppressed class who came here and was educated by Canadian missionaries and wrote about her experience as an MTA conductor in New York City during the pandemic, how she was beaten, how she was treated, how the MTA forced her to work, how she got COVID and nearly died, right? So even within those communities, there is a huge gap between those South Asians that are the haves and the have nots. Um, the other comment that I wanted to make is uh, um, most South Asians, oh, sorry, let me let me skip ahead. Uh, most South Asians who identify with this sort of these liberal and progressive policy positions still tacitly support Islamophobia, anti-Black racism, classism because of their position as a model minority and relatively wealthy position. Seeing themselves as casteless and disconnected from injustice, say, in India, against other marginalized communities, particularly during the pandemic, and I'll, I'll, I'll make a point about that, is this allows them to sort of inoculate themselves against such injustice. This doesn't happen in our community. And the real question is, who is our, right? Um, they will openly suggest that Muslims are different in India. They will suggest that caste is a backward system that, that certain groups now instrumentalize to get free stuff, right? They will openly suggest that it, when they see those same arguments being made by the black community, for example, they don't see the, 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 the connection. But what's, what's really troubling, right, is the ways in which those arguments are the same arguments that uphold white supremacy here, right? That people are seeking free stuff. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, many Indian Americans were angry at the Trump administration's ineptitude in handling the crisis because of the relative wealth suffered less, uh, be but because of relative wealth, they suffered less than others. Education levels are much higher in South Asian communities than they are on average in other communities here. But despite this, right, they also didn't recognize um, how they didn't face the same racist backlash that other Asian American communities did, like Koreans or Chinese or Vietnamese or Japanese. And what's interesting is that while decrying 
these uh, what they saw as racist conceptions like the Chinese virus. They didn't see the same problem in India of calling the same virus the Muslim virus. It turns out wherever you are, you have your own racist conception of the virus. Everyone's got their own. Um, and, in, and they didn't see that difference. Um, and so what was particularly troubling, right, was the lack of concern and indeed tacit praise being heaped on the Indian response to COVID-19 due to a prevailing belief in many South Asian communities, as particularly the first generation, that PM Modi was writing the country that had been economically backward for so long. Many dismissed claims, for example, during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly in March and April of 2020, um, regarding migrant workers who were put out of work and literally were starving to death in the streets. Um, many thought that this was fake news. I'm sure we've all heard this before echoing the same and parroting some of the same tropes that we heard from the conservative right here um, that were upholding white supremacy, right? They, you saw that same thing. And this was something that I think speaks to, and I'll, I'll sort of end um, with a few other remarks here, but um, this sort of speaks to how the summer protests one of the things, um, and I work locally with um, the Tamil Sangam here as a Tamil, um, and I also speak at a number of South Asian community organizations here for various religious events. Um, one of the shifts that I saw during the summer protests for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor is that for the first time, many communities were starting to recognize their solidarity with anti-Black racism. They saw how they had been perpetuating this and how they needed to fight back. In, compounded by the reports of the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on co communities of color that May Lin pointed out, seemed to bring home for the first time to many South Asians that Black Lives Mattering was different than the racism that they had suffered and that their privilege was intersectional in its impact. And the solidarity in between these communities was a valid pursuit. For the first time, we saw South Asian organizations collaborating actively with Black organizations, centering on restorative justice, as we see here at DU with the student organization RAR, which also includes members of our South Asian student organization. We are seeing this mostly at the youth level, but one last project I'll point out is that the Aspen Institute's Inclusive America project um, is starting to speak to many of these issues. They had a uh, webinar that talked about race, social justice, and interfaith communities, and also for the first time bringing together some of these South Asian communities. I think that um, most notably, South Asians started seeing themselves as part of a collective push for racial justice rather than seeing themselves as separate while also beginning to recognize their privilege in such a fight and how to instrumentalize such privilege to move this struggle collectively forward. They saw their ability to actually help Black lives matter, but not just Black lives, caste lives, right? Those communities that were less fortunate, they started to see Muslims as real people. Does this mean it's over? Absolutely not. However, that shift, I think, is really important as we think about the way in which the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the pan-Asian community um, and seeing the South Asian role particularly in that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deepa. So many, um, just so many layers to that and lots of things that I want to um, that I hope we can pick up on in the questions because I think the layers with being a model minority group along with the historical prejudice against Black Americans, but also really the ignorance of the, prior to that, the historical alliance between South Asians and the Black Civil Rights Movement that actually was, you know, really involved people uh, moving across the ocean and learning from each other and and a, a real solidarity um, during the I India's independence movement and thereafter uh, during this Black Civil Rights Movement. So I think uh, there are a lot of connections that we need to continue to discuss and I'm looking forward to 
talking about those somewhat in the questions. Our next speaker or our final speaker is uh, Viroxi Yi. She is uh, an expert in racially minoritized populations, Southeast, Southeast Asian American college students and equity and social justice. She's a Khmer American, first generation college graduate and a daughter of refugees. She's an assistant professor of educational leadership at the Kremen School of Education and Human Development at California State University in Fresno. Um, Viroxi conducts research to advance equity, access, and opportunity for historically underserved communities, such as racially minoritized Southeast Asian Americans and refugee populations. Her dissertation was a phenomenological exploration of the racialized experiences of Southeast Asian American community college students. And she earned her doctorate in higher education from the University of Denver. Welcome, Viroxi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, it's an honor to be here to return to DU. Um, I graduated in 2018 um, and was involved with um, IRISE and the Diversity Summit in some form or fashion as a graduate student. So I'm super excited to contribute and uh, participate in this way. Um, I'd also like to start off just my brief comments. I, I don't have slides prepared, but just thought that I'd speak to um, the topic from my perspective as a scholar, but also as um, a Southeast Asian American woman, um, you know, subject to um, all these systemic um, processes and, and issues that unfortunately we're all um, part of. Um, again, I'm a first generation um, college student. I'm Khmer American. I'm the first in my family to, to be born, to navigate the higher education system um, and to be able to have the privilege to, to move into a very privileged position as a faculty member and to be able to conduct work um, for my community in this type of space. Um, so I, I think it's safe to say uh, that all of my perspectives, all of my research is rooted in my identity as my American of, um, experiencing uh, race and ethnicity in very salient ways, very different ways um, within this Pan-Asian collective that we've been talking about. And I'm so glad that uh, Maylin, that you brought in um, uh, Jean Claire Kim's work on racial triangulation. I used that um, theory in my dissertation, which looked at the ways um, Southeast Asian American communities or co community college students. So those who identify as Hmong, Lao, Vietnamese and Cambodian or Khmer, um, experience race or how they are racialized in the community college setting. And especially connected to that is this idea of the model minority myth, but not just the model minority myth, but the deviant minority myth, because the racialization of Southeast Asian American communities is very different than say East Asian or South Asian communities, partly because um, I think Deepa, you brought in wealth, um, um, uh, the fo folks coming here as immigrants with wealth, well, as refugees, we're forced, right, um, to, to we're, my family was displaced from their countries, partly in large part to, due to um, US imperialism and the bombings of our country. And so um, the experience of refugees here in the last 41 years since the Refugee Act was signed has been really, um, I would say tumultuous, right, um, complicated. Um, connected to this larger Pan-Asian um, identity that unfortunately I don't think many Southeast Asian American communities feel a part of, partly because of those differences in class and experiences. Um, and so um, when we talk about um, Pan-Asian uh, coll uh, collectives and solidarity, um, I think it's really important that we recognize that we all have different experiences. And it's not just so much that, um, it's not so much as, for other communities outside of our Pan-Asian collective to hear, but to also for within our Pan-Asian collective to recognize and to um, acknowledge. Um, because oftentimes um, what we found is that uh, Southeast Asian Americans have been used, right, to, um, as a, a reason for why Asian American communities need resources. Uh, we, we, have, we're, we're, we have low educational attainment rates. We, live in um, you know, high rates of poverty, um, which is not, an ex is not um, by 
chance or by random, right? It's due to resettlement policies that pushed us into um, low resource areas that pit us or pit communities of color against each other for low resources. And so when we think about, um, you know, what's happening with um, violence against our Asian elders, um, thinking about the ways these cities and these um, spaces have been re um, constructed in a way to perpetuate violence, to pit communities against each other, it's no question why or how the model minority myth has worked so well, right? Um, to reinforce this narrative that um, our Asian American, Asian communities and black communities and other um, um, communities of color are fighting for resources amongst each other. And so something that I've been thinking about as not only as a scholar, but as a, just as a Khmer American woman is like, how do I engage in work that really, um, helps to support um, the advancement of Black Lives Matter, right? To ensure that my community understands that our collective liberation is connected to the liberation of Black lives and Black communities. And also to acknowledge that my community has been hurt in really salient important ways that can potentially be a hindrance to their ability to be part of the movement. And so um, when I was thinking about this question and um, thinking about you know, the impact of uh, COVID-19 and the racial injustice in um, our country, it's definitely brought to light, you know, what's exciting is that there's more conversations about Asian Americans as part of the movement. Um, and we've been part of the movement. I think uh, uh, many of us, uh, are the speakers have really spoke, spoken to that. However, um, I wanna, it's been interesting to see the anti-Asian sentiment that's arisen from, you know, COVID-19 pandemic. It's also highlighted, however, that Southeast Asian American communities have been impacted constantly by policies, racist policies, right? 14,000 um, Cambodian families are impacted by deportation orders right now and still are impacted by that. And so there's not been as much focus on this, however, um, we've, we've got so many communities focused on um, fighting this and um, trying, uh, finding ways to align the work so that our communities are not impacted. Um, we've talked about how our frontline workers, our workers of color, um, our C communities. In my family, we've had, my family, they're Southeast Asian, Amer they're Cambodian American, and we've had four cases of COVID in the last couple of months because they are frontline workers. You know, whereas, you know, it's been a really interesting space for me to be in, to be in a privileged position as faculty member and watching my cousins and my, my, my elders be impacted by COVID in this way. Um, and so I do want to talk about or, or center this idea of the invisible, invisibilization of Southeast Asian communities in this conversation. Um, and also recognizing that through racial triangulation, through relative valorization, that's for a very specific population, East Asians typically. And so Southeast Asians within that, and that's part of my work in my dissertation, is we find that Southeast Asians are racially and ethnically isolated. So when we're talking about that triangulation piece, Southeast Asians don't fit this model. And so that's some of my work in trying to understand how um, Southeast Asian American communities are racialized um, in ways to perpetuate and reinforce white supremacy. If we as a community don't engage in conversations to talk about our, the ways we are connected or disconnected in the movement, right, for liberation. Um, and so I also wanted to talk about uh, just briefly implications um, for racial justice as part of the prompt and then what some of my thoughts are about collective, this collective push towards equity. And something that I wrote was, um, I, I wrote this um, just briefly, this sentence of solidarity is threatened when we work in a zero sum game system of white supremacy, right? Um, when scarcity is, you know, it's what's, White supremacy reinforces scarcity within communities of color. I think white supremacy in general reinforces scarcity and its function, it, it's built upon an, a dimension of scarcity, right? There's not enough for everybody. And so if there's not enough for everybody, we have to create a system to ensure that my community gets what, what, I, what it needs it, at potentially the cost of others. And so when we think about this idea of the zero sum game, and I'm constantly thinking about this idea of more expansive ways. I think Maylin, you talked about it, fixed solidarity, all of that. 
like how can we uh, function in a way that we're not talking about zero sum game? I don't know what that looks like and I'm excited to have that conversation about what that looks like today. Um, and then in terms of the collective push towards equity, I, I, I want to encourage us to think about the ways that we can find connections and solutions, how systems, the systems work in specific ways, but it produces different results. And it's meant to produce different results to reinforce the pitting of communities of color against each other. So how can we um, uh, explore that and, and have honest conversations about what that looks like within our community? And then um, the other thing is, you know, working together does, to solve an issue does not, um, we need to work together in a way that does not perpetuate some systemic violence. I think again, Maylen, you mentioned that about we can't call for policing um, as a solution because it's never meant, it was never meant to be a solution to our problems. But it was meant to be a solution to white supremacist problems, right? And so um, on top of that, the solution is not the system. Um, you know, uh, it's not neoliberalism. It's not individualized um, racial capitalism, and it's not imperialism either, right? In the ways that how we are thinking about solutions is not about we're reinforcing the same tools that that were used against us. And so um, I think I, I there's a lot of things that I've been thinking about. Um, I, I will say that it's a personal conflict that I have, and how do I engage in these conversations that both center Asian American and Southeast Asian American communities, but not at the expense of, you know, our um, allies are, are of not, not at the expense of um, supporting and furthering advancing Black Lives Matter. And yet having honest conversations within our community about what that means in a space where it can be messy. And so I, I, talked about it with my commun uh, community of, of scholars and friends, and we wrote a piece together on Medium to just kind of talk about how our individual relationships to this work and how complicated it is and how it can be misinterpreted if we're not clear about what we're talking about. And so um, the other thing I finally want to talk about and mention is that something I'm conflicted with is how do we have these conversations outside of academia? Because I think we were in a privileged position to be here for this hour and a half talking about this work and yet our communities and the public is being terrorized, right? By, by the news and by everything. And so how do we do that? Because if they're being terrorized and there's fear, it's going to continue to perpetuate the same anti-blackness, the same calls for violence. Um, and so I think that was a little bit all over the place, but those are just some things that I'm thinking about as a person doing this work, not just as a researcher, but how, 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 how do I do this work in a way that uh, makes a difference and gets my family, right, to see this work, uh, that this is important. So those are some thoughts that I had and I'm happy to engage in more conversation about it. Thank you. Wow, such powerful comments. Um, thank you, Veraxi. I really think that there's so much there to talk about. And I too, and I'm sure our other panelists uh, wrestle with the essential identity of America being a white supremacist identity for the most part through its history and how through immigration, it's uh, you know adopted um, an idealistic message about equity and fairness and racial harmony, right? But at the same time, worked very hard to keep some racial groups um, out of the out of the halls of power um, and out of decision-making places, and keep them economically and socially suppressed. And so, I think that there is a lot of work to do to build these alliances. Um, at the same time as we want to achieve kind of the promise and the potential of America. Uh, and we can't do it if we don't recognize really the historical racism of America to so many communities of color, not just, certainly not just the Asian community. Uh, so uh, there are so many uh, things that we can talk about. I would really love to hear uh, questions from our viewers. If there are any questions, um, please 
provide them in the chat and we'll be sure to take some or, or in the Q&A um, and our panelists will be um, will do their best, I think, to answer them. Are there any questions or comments? So we're going to wait a couple minutes as people I'm sure are frantically typing. We just don't know yet. Uh, but um, I am very interested, as we're waiting for that, I'm very interested to hear um, whether people feel, particularly maybe in light of the um, election and of uh, Kamala Harris and her identity as a South Asian, her identity as a Black woman, her identity as really a d degree of alliance of understanding and working um, in two worlds, uh, what that means and whether that has an effect on the communities and the alliances that you're trying to build. Does any, do any of our panelists want to answer that before we move to our um, question that has come in the Q&A, which I'll read in just a moment. I'm happy to chime in a little bit. Um, I think Kamala Harris is an interesting figure. Um, she comes from a South Indian Brahmin family. I think that needs to be said, which means that she's Brahmins are especially South Indian Tam Brahms, as we often refer to ourselves, um, are more are some of the most privileged of Brahmins in India. There is even intersectionality between the Brahmin community, right? Brahmins in South India and Tamil Nadu don't recognize other castes. So you're either Brahmin or you're non-Brahmin. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't even recognize the other. So she comes from a family that actually um, did a lot of so-called social justice work. And I put it in scare mm -hmm. quotes because their idea of social justice work was treating their servant as like a human being, which is a big deal in the sense that so many didn't do that, right? Um, and by the way, Brahmins are uh, prejudiced against everyone. When I brought my partner to India, my grandmother refused to eat at the table with him, and he's a white man. He loves to tell that story. Um, but you know, what's I think interesting about Kamala Harris is the way that she has become a polarizing figure for South Asians as well. That like they want to argue that she's not really South Asian in some cases because she's black. And then you have black folks that are saying that she's not really black because she's also partly South Asian. Um, and so I think for her, like, I mean, thinking about her, I think it's it's in a lot of ways a representation of the tensions that both Viroxi and Mei Lin have highlighted, not only within intra in, inside Asian communities, but also more broadly, the kinds of tensions that we see in, and the, let's say the challenges we face when we think about solidarity between different communities of color, because she sort of represents the ways in which those tensions play out all on her own space. And of course, she's also hypersexualized as a woman, right? Like her sexual, you know, histories are being brought forward as ways to sort of discredit her. I, I know that also her, like, she failed the bar and that was like, you know, somehow like her education and her like, ability is also being questioned, right? Like, and then she passed it later on. Of course, everyone knows I'm not a law student, but California bar is supposed to be the most difficult from what I understand. So, so anyway, I, I think that she's a really interesting figure because of those. I always wonder, and I, I'll leave it with this. I always wonder, would a man who had had her position maybe have um, behaved the way that she did or, or enacted the policies she did as a DA and as a state's attorney. Like she, she was under a lot of pressure as, as the first female, first black woman who was in that position. And I'm wondering like, you know, how she navigated that. I don't know, you know, um, but I think that like, there's a lot more riding on her in that position that also I think impacted and it makes more complex for us to understand some of her more anti-black, let's be real about it, policies as a DA. And I, I'm not forgiving or forgetting, but I, I think um, it is a factor to understand her and being elected now to the highest office. A lot of my South Asian family who are really progressive don't think she will be an ally 
And I think that that's really interesting um, in, in, in very fascinating ways. That is really interesting. Thank you for um, that, those comments, um, Deepa. Really appreciate it. Are there any other, anyone else want to weigh in or shall we move to the first question in the Q&A? Okay, so the first question um, that we have uh, is, as a black woman, for me, it is important that we continue to acknowledge the similarities and experiences to continue building the connections between communities of color. I have a question. What other tangible, actionable steps can we take to continue building community among all communities of color? I could take a first try at that. Yes. Um, so to kind of um, continue on some of the themes um, that my fellow panelists brought up and also just from my presentation, um, I, I included a couple screenshots of some of ex some examples, I think of just active solidarity about ways that we can um, both address the, the pain of viol um, that comes from violence uh, being caused upon Asian elders but also do so in ways that have really broad solutions that, that um, again, are not kind of re, trying to actively not perpetuate these forms of violence that black and brown communities face. And so one is that I think one actionable step is I think looking to folks who are doing that, who are um, enacting those kinds of solutions. So for example, in, in Oakland's Chinatown, there's groups who are coming together to kind of form like community safety plans that are not about calling the police, but are about building community and relationships so that we can um, preempt violence, um, but also respond in ways that are not going to lock up more black, black and brown folks. So I think looking for things like mutual aid, looking for things like community-based safety plans. But then third, you know, I think they're also, um, and Brock, I wanted to add on to um, kind of Roxy's point about like, um, for example, the specificity of Southeast Asian American experiences, but also fighting anti-Blackness. There's an organization I admire greatly um, in Long Beach, California, which has the largest, home to the largest population of Cambodian folks outside of Cam Cambodia. It's a group called Khmer Girls in Action. And to me, there's such a great model of how you can really um, center, because for a lot of these young folks, so they work with Kamai and other Southeast Asian young folks in Long Beach, and they really center their experience because they don't learn about what happened to their parents, to their community members in school. There's no Kamai language in school, even though there's such a huge population, there's just this violent erasure and visibilization of their communities. Their, their communities are experiencing PTSD and also are in disinvested communities. Um, Kamai Girls in Long Beach, I think, really centers that in their political education and their cultural work. Um, but at the same time, they're also fighting for solutions um, that push back against criminalization and then push for more resources and abundance in their communities. Recently, they just won a ballot initiative for a youth development fund um, that's about, you know, funding kind of the positive youth development support um, that young folks need. And they did this after doing um, action research, both by KGA, but also in solidarity with other Black and um, Latinx, um, Indigenous-led uh, youth organizations, where they found you know, that Long Beach is spending $10,000 on uh, policing, punishment, and suppression. And I forget what the exact amount was, but like, you know, an obscenely small amount on youth development. So I think looking to folks who are both pushing for those kinds of structural changes but also enacting it through mutual aid, through community safety, I think are some really actionable steps. And there's wonderful examples of, of folks doing that all around. And I appreciate that question, right? Because sometimes it's easy to critique. We know it's wrong, but what's right? You know, how do we enact it? And sometimes it's experimental because the systems make it hard to imagine outside of it. But people are definitely doing it. I'd like, thank you, Maylin, for that. I wanted to add in um, just some thoughts too. This is, I think this is the question of the day or of the moment for me, and, and especially in relation to the article that I shared. Um, how do we engage in solidarity um, when there's so many issues at stake and so many lives impacted, right? And, and sometimes it's really hard to recognize when we need to prioritize certain um, you know, causes and things like that. And of course, Black lives total need to prioritize um, in this moment. I think what the what's this moment is bringing up is a question of at what times do we center actually 
Asian American or Southeast Asian American issues? And when is the appropriate space and time to center that? Um, I think that the, an actionable step that we can take is um, I appreciate the engagement of you attending a session like this, right? Because I think oftentimes when we're talking about Asian American issues where it's in an Asian American primarily primary space. And so while we still need to work on our conversations in that space, like having the, um, the ability to engage with folks so folks can understand and learn from these experiences is really important. So we're talking about maybe potentially it's not like the, the structural or systemic um, actions right now, but it's how can we learn about what's going on and what's how it's impacting us? Because the Southeast Asian American community is also impacted by um, policing. You know, uh, profiling of Southeast Asian American men, um, that, that's an intersection that we could lean into and to have conversation with uh, other communities of color to explore how we can solve it because it's an impact that impacts, I mean, it's an issue that impacts so many different groups, right? And so I think the conversation has to start there and the engagement of our different communities so that we're not in silos. Um, and, I, and totally, I think that there are community, local community activists, organizations that are doing the work so much better than I would say in academia. Um, because, I mean, we can, that's a whole other issue, other conversation, but um, I appreciate bringing to, to light that there are communities that are doing this work, but part of it requires us listening and recognizing when is the appropriate time and when to make time to center issues that impact the Asian American community. I, I would just love to add a little bit to that because student organizations are doing this work as well. And that's and that's what I'm, I think uh, both May and um, Varaxi pointed out to some of the areas of like where we can find common ground and students are doing that. And that's what I'm seeing across the country as well as here at DU. Um, the organization um, RAR, um, R-A-H-R, is really doing that work. They are centering a number of different organizations, including something we haven't talked too much about here, but indigenous organizations and indigenous rights. Um, and then they are finding those areas of common ground. They're pushing forward activities that can bring people together. And to, to echo what Varoxi said, which I think is so important, is about policing. And I think both of you have talked a lot about it. Um, right now, we often think of ICE detainees and undocumented immigrants as only somehow like Mexican or Latin or something like that, right? But there are Asians that are in those detention facilities there and they don't actually even get represented, right? Like there are Asians from various communities that are in those spaces that are also facing that violence of ICE and facing the violence of immigration policies. And I think that's another area in which we can find common ground. Thank you very much. Um, our next question uh, also in the Q&A is, with the recent events, and I think it's particularly for Viroxy, but I think uh, anyone could answer. Uh, with the recent events uh, in the news of anti-Asian and violence against this community, how do you suggest navigating and supporting the Black Lives Matter movement while addressing what's happening to the APIDA community? And there's also a attendee who would like to answer the question as well. But um, first, would Viraxi like to chime in and give your thoughts on that? Sure, thank you, Dong, for that question. Hi, by the way. Um, I, uh, this is, it's, so I think we're raw right now with what's happening in, in the news and, and the hurt and all of that. And so this is a really important question. Um, something that I think actually needs to happen is to center the pain that uh, that our Asian American you know families are dealing with right now in the community. Um, so I'm reading this book here. It's called um, My Grandmother's Hands: um, Racialized Trauma and the Pathways to Mending Our Hearts and Our Bodies by Resma Menachem. I'm 
I apologize for mispronouncing their name, but um, this book has given me a, a really different perspective on um, how racialized trauma is rooted in the body and how our bodies, right, like um, hold trauma and react in different ways. And so I think just in the same way that um, the trauma for Black bodies needs to be centered and highlighted, we also have to center and highlight the trauma in Asian American bodies as impacted by white supremacy. And so actually, I think leaning in to center the trauma of Asian Americans is one way that we can begin to build towards a collective understanding of how we can be rooted in um, anti-Black liberation, uh, uh, liberation, Black liberation and communities of color. And so, because what I'm, 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 I'm having these conversations with family members and they're, so they're so upset. They're really upset and 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 in pain, angry, and probably a little anti-black, like you know, uh, in 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 these moments. And so, when I think about how I can respond as someone who spends my time twenty four seven thinking about these things, but recognizing that my family, they're not in the space to, they don't have the tools, they don't have the means to kind of do that. Now is not the time for me to tell them, well, the system, oh, it works this way and you shouldn't think this way and we shouldn't do this. I think that's the, the, the fast, that will fast track them towards a, a, a direction that I don't want them to go in. And so actually I would say, let's take a step back and honor and talk about the trauma and, and create space to talk about these feelings so that we can release them from our bodies and our communities so that we can collectively move towards, um, you know, liberation. And I know it feels like all like woohoo kind of like, you know, uh, community. I mean, I don't know. I just think that we need to re return to some of that to do that work and to release some of that before we are of use to the movement. Just some thoughts um, on that. I'd love to hear May and Deepa, your thoughts too. Would anyone else like to jump in, Maylin? I think that's a really good point, and I think it's real. We have to acknowledge people's um, pain. I think when we don't, people feel unheard, and it can, in the long term, you know, deepen. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that, but I agree. <laughs> it's important, really important to to listen to um, and, and hold space for that. Um, I think another uh, another thing that I think people have been responding to with the Oakland case in particular was that when people are scared, they do make quick calls for action that are harmful. Like I think someone put a bond out, you know, like put a but you know putting a bond out for a black looking for a black man. We know that that is not a good thing, right? And so I do think it's like other people will want to push and. We have to decide, you know, where in the intervention we lie, but someone needs to intervene against that, right? It doesn't need to be us necessarily, but um, I think those things do happen, need to happen simultaneously. It doesn't mean that we need to do all the parts of the work, um, but they do need to happen simultaneously because of the way that people respond when they hear crime and violence and want to immediately refer to mass incarceration and policing, right? Um, I think the other thing that this makes me think of, Roxy's point makes me think of, is that we have to, and I see it in the questions too, it means that the conversations need to happen not only when there's a crisis or when something terrible happens, but all the time. And I know that is immensely frustrating as someone who has also had uh, um, a very frustrating time with my own parents and people in my own community and other East Asians. But I think it means that we, that uh, consciousness raising and political education um, needs to come from a place of deep relationship building that is not just a reactiveness to a crisis, but us building that within our communities. And it's okay to recognize that that takes time. Um, I think my parents are a little bit more willing to listen to me after I try to normalize and talk about it all the time. Um, so I think it further reinforces the point that this is just an ongoing process. Um, and because it's not always the best time uh, in a moment of, of crisis and immense pain. So um, I'm not sure, thank you so much. I'm not sure how to include one of our attendees would like to contribute um, with an answer to that same question. 
and I'm not sure how to do that. How to unmute them or allow them to participate. Well, perhaps while that's figured out, because Mary Henderson had indicated that she would like to, um, I, I think she would like to um, answer and provide her perspective as well. Uh, but we can go to our next question as well, which is how can we best educate our other um, BIPOC members and brothers and sisters about the model minority myth? It's tough when our large AAPI population is not disaggregated and we are grouped with and seen as privileged as white people. Because of this, our issues are dismissed and minimized. I mean, I'll briefly say, because I'd really rather defer to my esteemed colleagues here because I feel like they'll know much more about it. Um, I'll just cite one statistic that was I found very troubling. Um, so right before the election this year, um, the AAPI um, like organization that was doing polling on, on Asians and where how they were going to vote pointed out, I mean, and this was, by the way, big news in India because, you know, they were very excited. They love Trump there and this is the problem, right? Um, and so they put it out that so many South Asians were going to vote for Trump. And I want to point out again that 89% of people of South Asian communities, particularly, and Asians in general, voted for Obama. And there has been a somewhat of a shift, even from Hillary Clinton to Joe Biden. And there has been a larger shift, particularly in a South Asian community. And I think this speaks to one thing, like which is, again, we need to, first of all, South Asians have to recognize solidarity with other Asian groups. They don't always. And I think lot, largely for some of the issues that Viroxy had raised, that they don't see themselves. And there's also their inherent prejudice against everyone that they see is not South Asian as somehow Chinese. And I'm not, this is a racism within the South Asian community that has not ever really been addressed. They're like, either you're you're this Asian or you're that Asian for them. You know what I mean? And that's and that's something that they they take umbrage with being labeled as Asian, for example. This is something that you often see. And I think that like thinking about that statistic, there is um, and particularly um, among Hmong who are largely conservative, right? Like they they are the only Asian group that I know of that was pretty divided over Trump, like many of them did vote um, conservative, right? So we're not a monolith and that needs to be addressed, I think first in the communities themselves. And I think I really appreciated both, especially Viroxy's comments and May's about like thinking about how to address this in our own communities and the ways that we do it. It reminds me a lot of like how I addressed um, Br Brahmanical supremacy in my own community and I had to cut off so many family members on WhatsApp because they were just saying racist stuff and I couldn't handle it and I had to say I can't talk to you even though you're my mom's brother and things like that and um, addressing it directly it reminds me a lot of my fam our friends who had to go home to racist family members and say I can't believe you're voting for Trump or you're voting in this way or you're supporting these policies and speaking out is hard and when it's your family and speaking out when it's not a crisis is so important i think like malin pointed out but to me that's actually how you do you know sort of build um this type of solidarity amongst bio by pocs by also like recognizing the issues that occur within individual communities first of all recognizing i think Varaxi, you said this so well that's why i put it in the chat but mm -hmm. it's not a zero-sum game but white supremacy really wants us wants us to like think of it that way mm -hmm. right that there's not a scarcity in in, in like and and i think recognizing our areas of commonality and sort of also recognizing that we have individual issues that plague our own communities. I mean, the anti-blackness and caste and classism in South Asian communities needs to be addressed by South Asian communities. There are certainly ways we can think of that through other types of solidarity. However, those issues need to be addressed before we can find more common ground between BIPOC communities, in my view, um, partly. And that work, 
largely just like I ask white people, I'm not going to go talk to racist people. I lived in racist Ohio and I could, I'm not going to go talk to those people. That's the job of my white friends. And I'm going to be really blunt about that. Um, but my job is to go talk to my racist relatives and tell them like how, because I can get to them. I can speak to them. I can get them to see those perspectives that this is anti-Muslim in particular is a problem in my family. This is anti-Black. You can't say things like that. And that's my job. And I want to do that work, right? And I think we all have to have those conversations. Then we can find common ground. And sorry to sort of, I get passionate about this particular issue. I think it's a good thing to get passionate about. And I, I really do um, appreciate your forthrightness about uh, when we're able to do those things that we think are our job that nobody else can do. I mean, nobody else can maybe talk to our own communities about anti-Black racism and caste race, casteism that exists within our own communities. It's very difficult, I think, for them to hear. Uh, I think white folk uh, trying to talk to them would feel embarrassed and feel put off because there's an answer was like, well, you just don't understand our culture. And um, it's, it's pretty easy to quell those conversations, but it's much uh, more difficult for our parents and our peers to have those conversations with us when we're coming from an educated um, and experienced perspective, right? I do understand the culture and this part of the culture is in fact racist. And we need to own up to it in order to move past it, right? In order to move through it. Uh, and I think it is a, a problem within our communities, whether we're talking about immigrants and refugees and different kinds of Asian groups, the way we are put together uh, as this sort of pan-Asian community. So we all get brushed, we all get painted with the same brush, um, even when that's really unfair, right? We cannot experience what so many of our our um, other communities are experiencing, uh, we all get painted with the same brush of, oh, they're really hardworking and they really value education. Um, and, uh, but the experience of refugees as Veroxy pointed out so beautifully before is of course very, very different than the, from the experience of educated, you know, highly educated South Asians who have come over um, to populate the tech industry in California, or the number of um, them who are working, who are frontline workers in the health industry um, for being, you know, the number of South Asian doctors, you only have to watch any of, you know, all the MSNBC shows and, and every medical expert appears to be a South Asian um, physician. Uh, when you're looking at those, um, those frontline workers, um, and not failing to recognize the other Asian frontline workers who are working in more challenge, you know, different kinds of challenges, lower socioeconomic ranks um, in these really um, challenging times. I apologize for that. I'm at home and my son started playing his guitar. I apologize. <laughs> um, thank you for, for those comments. I, I also wanted to add that um, this question again, I feel like all these questions are the questions that I'm like grappling with with my life as a scholar um, and as a person in this work. I, I wanted to share one of my dissertation um, participants um, talked about her experience um, participating in Black Lives Matter. They're a Cambodian American um, um, woman and uh, they talked about going to Black Lives Matter protests and going to rallies and um, so some of the other attendees um, said to them, why are you even here? Asian Americans, you don't know, you don't understand what racism is, or you, you don't have it hard, right? And so um, I think that's the, like, this highlights exactly, um, you know, how the world um, or society views Asian Americans um, as number one, a monolith that we don't experience racism or other isms um, in our society. And as long as there's a dismissal of other folks' experiences, solidarity is endangered, right? Um, 
I think I said earlier, in some ways, you know, we have we have to recognize when um, issues are um, need to be highlighted, um, but also not at the expense of dismissing these issues, because that definitely is going to um, limit solidarity and limit um, folks' capacity to be part of the movement. And I don't know that I have an answer to this, and, and except for the fact that this is part of my work about you know exploring, uncovering what um, how the model minority myth is a racial wedge, um, and yet we still have these moments of folks not recognizing that anti-Asian sen sentiment is a thing. Um, I don't have an answer, but just a story <laughs> about how that hurts us. I, I wanted to add something because I felt like in the questions there was a, a strong desire just for like, yeah, how do we talk to our community? How do we talk to other folks? And I think all of us have, have tried our best to give specific resources and models. And I just want to acknowledge that it's that it's hard. Like I, I think, um, you know, I shared my own experience. I get extremely frustrated and angry <laughs> hearing racist things from people I love and from people um, in community with me in other ways. I think it's okay to recognize that it's hard. Some things um, I feel like have been helpful are it's okay to be angry and it's um, maybe helpful to find other space to vet <laughs> so that you can be generous in the moment with other people. And I want to acknowledge that's really hard when people are saying messed up things that really upset you. Um, but uh, as I get older, I think I try to find space to manage that separately so I can come to these spaces with abundance and generosity. And I try to think about myself too, right? Like I wasn't born into this world. Like I had a, I continue, you know, to grapple with it myself. I'm not perfect. And, um, you know, I got politicized myself by people who were generous with me and took the time to have conversations and to challenge me in a loving way. And so I try to remind uh, myself of being in that. I try to come to other people with that kind of uh, love and generosity. Granted, not everyone deserves it. You know, sometimes you'll have to draw boundaries around who does not, who is not coming at you with good faith um, and recognizing that. Um, you, you don't owe people who, who don't have good faith, who don't wanna listen, you know, that labor. Um, but I think there are people out there who, who genuinely may not know, may not have been exposed to these theories, these critiques. And, um, you know, we owe them space to transform and grow. But it's hard sometimes to understand where that boundary is, and, and that's something I still struggle with too. Really powerful words, I think, to end with, May, um, Maylin. And I, I would just add, you know, I think we have an opportunity right now when the space of conversation is perhaps not so overwhelmed by one individual with a loudspeaker um, and I know everybody knows who I'm talking about um, in the context of racist tropes and white supremacy and uh, trying to work work things forward so I don't know for sure how long that um, that little bit of room will last uh, in terms of having these conversations with those people that we might usually say do not have really, they really don't deserve um, our time and our patience and our generous spirit in educating them. I do find in my experience so much of the, so much of the hatred, so much of the animosity, the anger, the frustration um, comes from a place of ignorance. And I feel very privileged to be with all of you and to be part of this conversation and to be part um, to be part of this uh, panel, uh, talking with all of you as we all work to educate our communities and ourselves, uh, working towards greater racial solidarity and social justice. I think that our, um, our host would like to say a couple of words, but thank you all very much for your time and your wisdom today. What thank an incredible... 
What an incredible panel. And I just want to give a big thanks to um, our wonderful speakers who joined us today. Um, that was really something else. And I know that I learned a lot. Um, as a final reminder, for those of you who joined us live today, you will receive an email with a link for a session evaluation. Uh, we greatly appreciate your feedback. Please view the online schedule and register for our upcoming Diversity Summit sessions. Thank you again for joining us. And we hope you will join us for our next next um, two panels tomorrow. Um, they're going to be great. Beginning at noon, the Black community will host an identity conversation, and this will be followed by the multiracial community um, starting at 2 p.m. So please join us for those uh, conversations and the rest of this week of the Diversity Summit. Thank you again, everyone.